Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, online lecture. An uh, online lecture which is linked with the exhibition called Revolution, the exhibition that is now at the Zarenta Gallery in Warsaw. I am Jérôme Bazin. I am one of the two uh, curators with Joanna Kordiak of the exhibition called Revolution. And I'm very glad to introduce this, uh, this series of, uh, of lecture. Uh, this session today begins a series of lectures happening every Wednesday at the same hour, uh, 7 p.m. And uh, for, for this lecture, we have invited researchers to, to present different topics to present images, to present uh, artists, careers of artists, or to present historical issues related with the exhibition, as, as it is the case today. We, so we have a first series of lectures in June, and we will have in September a second series of, uh, of lectures. And today we are very, very glad to begin with a lecture by Muriel Blev. Thank you very much, Muriel, uh, to have accepted the invitation and to be with us. Uh, just a few words about, uh, about you. You are a researcher at the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes in, uh, in Prague. You, you work on uh, everyday life history of the communist period using both archives and also interviews. And it's uh, this, um, uh, these two sources, uh, written archives and interviews, uh, it gives uh, to, to your work uh, this, um, this ability to, to approach individuals, individual point of view or opinion. Um, and among your many, many works, we can quote your book, uh, which is entitled Perceptions of Society in Communist Europe, Regime Archives and Popular Opinion. Perception of Society in Communist Europe, Regime Archives and Popular Opinion. It has been uh, published at, uh, by, at Bloomsbury in uh, 2018. And uh, for the preparation of the exhibition called Revolution, this book has been quite important for us. Um, it's a very, very interesting book to understand and to problematize also uh, how societies were described during the socialist period, how they were approached, how they were divided, um, and how they were described by the communist authorities, of course, but also by citizens. And uh, it's very interesting in the different contribution to this book to see how the citizens, the different citizens, how they perceived the society, how they described it, um, how they described the changes, uh, how they described the divisions, uh, also the tensions inside, uh, inside society. All these kind of elements that we find back in the exhibition in a very, very different way with images, but um, we have here a parallel uh, that, um, that explains that this book was uh, quite important for, for us. And actually in the, in the exhibition, in the exhibition called Revolution uh, at Zarenta, in the last room, uh, we present an archive, an archive which is next to two images, and it's an archive that comes from, from your book that you quote in your, in your article. Um, it's a letter from uh, from fifty six, a letter from from a Czechoslovak woman, who commented the situation in Hungary. So we are in the heat of the of the revolution, the Hungarian revolution. And it's a very very fascinating document. She speaks about about propaganda, but also about the war, the fear of the war. And uh, we are very glad that you. Uh, that you are with us to, to speak about such topics, about uh, the events of 56, about the societies and the perception of societies and perception of, uh, of events. So thank you again, Muriel. And just a last thing uh, before I give you the floor, a remark for everyone in the audience. Uh, so this is a one hour event. Uh, we. Muriel will have uh, his, uh, his lecture and we will have a time at the end for, for discussion. So if you have questions or comments, you can write them in the comment section. This is a comment section. So write them and I will collect the question and the comment and read them uh, at the end of the, of the session. And you can write in English or in Polish 
Um, Milena Kudlika uh, helps me uh, to for, for the question in Polish, so don't hesitate to write uh, either in Polish or in, or in English. I give you the floor, Muriel, and uh, thank you again. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation. I'm only um, extremely sad that this could not take place in Warsaw as was uh, originally intended. And unfortunately, it's yet again a Zoom conference, a conference over the internet, but better than nothing. So thank you so very much. Um, since you um, asked me about this document and uh, since you quoted it in the archives uh, and quoted my book, um, my edited volume, um, I decided to center my presentation on the um, on the, the, the article that I wrote, the chapter that I wrote for this book. And I will actually cite uh, not the woman you mentioned, but her husband uh, when he wrote back to her. And I will, I will um, tell about his point of view uh, from the Hungarian border. So my presentation is called A Postcard from 1956 National Stereotypes and Ideological Clichés in Czechoslovakia. The year 1956 was one of those years that saw a lot of significant events around the world. And let us just remember uh, the nationalization of the Suez Canal and the Second Arab-Israeli War. But as far as the communist world was concerned, it was also a watershed moment. Nikita Khrushchev, the first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, convened the 20th Congress of the party um, in February 1956 and presented his so-called secret speech. In it, he denounced for the first time the crimes of Stalin and the terror regime that Stalin had led. These incredible revelations caused terrible shock to the devoted comrades who had believed in Stalin. It also created the momentum for events to take place later in the year in Poland and Hungary, a major change in Poland and a revolution in Hungary. But what was going on at the time in the country lying exactly between Poland and Hungary, that is Czechoslovakia? What was happening to the only true Central European democracy in the interwar period, as Czechoslovaks liked to call themselves? The atmosphere there was very different as the following anecdote testifies. The Hungarian revolution started as a demonstration intending to show solidarity with the regime change that was happening in Poland and that saw the return of the independently minded leader, Władysław Gomułka. In return, the Polish Red Cross sent help to the Hungarian revolutionaries. As the convoy crossed Czechoslovakia, an informant of the Czechoslovak secret police, the STB, talked with these Poles. They told him, you might have a higher standard of living here, but we, at least, are free. They complained about being followed by the STB and about being needlessly bullied, for instance, by being made to wait one entire night at the border for no reason. So if the Czechoslovaks were helping neither the Poles nor the Hungarians, what were they doing? To cut a long story short, the answer is nothing of much significance. Of course, the Second Writers Congress took place that year and saw courageous criticism of the party policy in cultural matters. Also, the students did put forward a resolution in which they demanded better studying conditions and the abolition of the censorship. There was also a minor call for a party congress on the part of 1% of party members <clears throat> these party members who were shocked by what they got to hear about the secret speech. And finally, there was a hint of criticism concerning Godval's so-called cult of the personality at a national party conference that took place in June 1956. Godwald was the uh, Czechoslovak equivalent of Stalin. But what is perhaps more relevant or most relevant of all is that none of these potential trails of revolutionary criticism actually held any collective support of any sort. Neither the writers nor the students massively supported the few in their midst who were willing to go further and seriously challenge the regime. No one greeted the party apparatchik, Jewish, who criticized Comrade Godwald. Had a big crowd awaited this hero to applaud him and show him unrestrained support, a Czechoslovak nod, a 
could have been born then and there, but this did not happen. So what actually happened as the revolutionary days overwhelming Poland and Hungary, what were the people thinking and what they, why they collectively um, stand aside is what I would present here, um, an, an answer that was provided by the Czechoslovak citizens themselves as recorded by the secret police, the STB agents. These files are not files of individuals, but general information files on the mood of the population. The STB, in particular, the section in charge of the fight against the internal enemy, compiled a dense collection of reports about the population and its feelings in October and November 1956. The information was mostly collected by their informant networks, secret collaborators who were recruited amongst the general population and who factually reported on what they heard. Even before the communist takeover in 1948, these collaborators were considered the most important information source by the STB. Collaborators are recruited in all layers of the nation so that they have a faithful picture of reality at all times and in all domains. They conducted, said uh, the STB, they conducted their spying activity for the most part unnoticed, simply listening in or participating in conversations in the workplace, in shops, on the streets and in pubs, and reports are usually a few pages long. In more professional districts, they often include the full name of the incriminated citizen and even their address, indicating serious police background work. Agents in the former Sudetenland, like the towns of Usti nad Labem or Liberec, were particularly meticulous in their work, um, which indicates that this region, region was particularly important. Two elements were of special interest for the police the subject's membership in any political party, past or present, and their profession. The reports reflect rumors that circulated among the population. One amusing one is a notice from Liberec that people were rushing to buy vinegar to shield themselves against the nuclear bombs that they feared would soon hit them. But my main argument here will be the lack of protest of or what some would call the passivity of the Czechoslovak population is only concealing its absence of major disagreement with the communist regime and the many benefits it had to offer. Most people did wish a hasty demise of communism and the return of democracy, but their standard of living meant they had something to lose, and hence they were not prone on taking risks. So we will review, first of all, <clears throat> the so-called cultural argument. It would be in the nature of Czechs and even Slovaks not to add, not to ask, not to act in any violent way. And that is allegedly why nothing happened in Czechoslovakia in 1956. But we will see afterwards that actually the people who did not support the communist regime appeared quite capable of violent actions. We will see as well that there was a real expectation among the population and even among many officials that the regime was about to collapse and democracy return. Why then did the regime not collapse? It is mainly, as we will see last, due to the relatively high standard of living of the population. So we could uh, uh, start a cultural inquiry by wondering what the Czechoslovak citizens were talking about as the battle was already raging in the streets of Budapest. It seems that they had concerns of a very different nature than their fighting neighbors. And one of them was the fate of the red stars, the archetypal communist symbol. The red stars were adorning public buildings as well as locomotives or buses. In their May resolutions, the students had already demanded that they be taken down, just as they demanded that the Soviet anthem not be played anymore at the end of the daily radio and TV broadcasts. Symbols of the Soviet domination and of a hated regime for some, token of stability and progress for others, the Red Stars raised a particular interest in 1956, especially as regards the tense relations between the Slovaks and the Hungarians. The reports tell us that the manager of a Slovak mechanical factory told while more or less laughing, which was not a good thing, that the Czechoslovak locomotive had been attacked on the Hungarian side of the border station of Komarno to dismantle its Red Star. 
a railway worker confirmed that he had as well been coerced into taking down the Red Star from his locomotive when he crossed Hungary. A Czechoslovak citizen back from Hungary described the fact that the Red Star Hotel in Budapest had just been rechristened National Hotel and information sufficiently important in his eyes to appear in prime position in his report. A salesman from Nitra in Slovakia coming back from a group trip to Budapest, refused to talk about what he had seen, restraining himself to the remark that they had had to take down the red star from the bus to be able to get home. A mason ended in jail for having criticized the wearing of a red star by a train conductor and for having promised him that it would be soon torn apart from his clothes as was happening these days in Hungary. The Red Star issue busied the mind of many a traveler during a collective trip to Hungary. Several groups of Slovaks who had gone to the Balaton Lake on vacation found themselves stuck in Budapest on 23rd of October 1956, at the time when the revolution broke out. According to the written accounts, most of them were terrified and secluded themselves in their hotel while awaiting a chance to go home. Apparently, very few went out to even see what was going on. According to several testimonies, the women were crying. The travelers were so nervous that they kept their national flag cautiously displayed on the hotel tables at which they sat to kill the time. Bitter comments followed the refusal of the Czechoslovak embassy to secure their repatriation. The travelers did not seize this unexpected chance to flee west. Only two out of the 53 passengers who were members of the Hungarian minority in Slovakia and who had relatives in Budapest, refused to go back to Czechoslovakia, only two out of 53. So why would the people be so concerned with protecting this, protecting this symbol of communism? Was it because they realized that the communist regime had a strong base in this country and it would be foolish to try and challenge it? Certainly, at least in part. But interestingly enough, the vast majority of the population, maybe up to 75%, and among them, many are communists, anticipated the regime to come to an end soon. Some expected the collapse, uh, that the collapse would take place within two days, others that it would be within five days, others that it would be the following week, others still before the end of the year. In any case, not many people believed this regime was there to last. In the official ranks, the celebration of two anniversary days was expected to provide an unwelcome opportunity for trouble, first for the creation of Czechoslovakia on 28th of October, and secondly for the October Revolution on 7th of November, and the police, police units were put on maximum alert. But it seems that the political activism of the population was really feeble. According to historian Jerzy Pernes, a group of persons had indeed prepared a demonstration on Wenceslas Square in Prague on 28th of October. But because the weather changed for the worse and it started to rain, no one went to the demonstration, not even the organizers. The problem was that very few people were willing to take any concrete risks. The regime fall was to occur not only without violence, but as well without the people having actually to do anything. At best, they were hoping free elections would be organized and this would be it. At worst, there would be a third world war and the Americans would come to freedom. The American diplomats, on the other hand, were quite discouraged by the passivity of the Czechs and Slovaks. In his, I'm quoting, observations on the limpness of the Czechoslovak people, Ambassador Briggs made reference to the early impression reported therein that notwithstanding widespread opposition to communist domination, the citizens of Czechoslovakia do not appear to be the stuff from which revolutions are made. The foregoing is not to say that the Czechs are unpatriotic or incapable of resistance, but that their resistance appears to be of a passive, slow-burning nature, consistent perhaps with the circumstances of their history during the past three centuries, but producing few seeds likely to sprout as dragon's teeth into an army capable of throwing off their present slavery." Unquote. The Czechs and Slovak secretly recorded by the STB could not have agreed more. As a former Czech uh, merchant expressed it, he personally wouldn't want to dirty his hands, others would do it. According to a Slovak colleague, the system was to collapse by itself just like a house of cards. 
A worker from a chemical factory judged that the Czechs were too coward to act like in Hungary. Yet another worker thought that the Czechs would be the last ones to break away from the Soviets because they were opportunists and didn't want to risk anything. A former shopkeeper and an employee were viewing the Czechs as old grandmas as opposed to the Hungarian lads. A railroad worker said he had heard on the Swiss radio that the Czechs, as a cultural nation, would be among the last to get rid of communism. This national character stereotype even permeated the relations between Czechs and Slovaks. If a change was to take place, it was expected to start in the other part of the country. The most extravagant rumors were circulating. In Slovakia, people were telling that arms and ammunition were already being distributed to the Czechs, but that their own security forces were holding things too tight for them to join them. A, a driver assured his colleagues that the atmosphere was starting to rot in the Czech lands and the people over there were rebelling. An employee who came back from Brno, back to Slovakia, told that the people there were unhappy in Brno, getting ready to rebel and that everyone was expecting something similar to what had happened in Poznań. The workers from a factory in Partizanske judged that nothing could happen in Slovakia. If something started, it would be in the Czech lands, for instance, in Prague, Przeň, or Ostrava. A Slovak citizen coming back from a trip deemed the atmosphere in Brno chaotic. According to her, people were telling there that Slovakia was about to break away from the historical provinces, and they were convinced that a new world war was about to break out and a monetary devaluation to take place. An employee from Nové Zámky told his colleagues that the atmosphere was starting to stink in Prague and in Bratislava, even in Bratislava, so already in Slovakia, and that the people were already rebelling. A former high functionary thought that things could break out in Bratislava, but it would first begin in the Persian region before getting onto Ostrava and then to the border region with Slovakia. The Czechs suddenly didn't want to be outdone by the Slovaks and had very similar thoughts. Two former shop owners from Liberec, so this time on the Czech side, thought that the Hungarian events would soon expand to Slovakia and would only later reach Moravia and Bohemia. A former soldier who had fought on the Western Front during the Second World War was convinced that the troubles had already started in Slovakia and it would soon, it would soon begin a hope shared by the two persons he was speaking to. A social security employee who doubted that the Czech worker could get interested in anything else but his well-being and the contents of his plate, nevertheless thought that something could happen in Slovakia. A peasant was expecting things to begin any day but first in Slovakia, since he judged the Slovaks to be more courageous than the Czechs. A Slovak member of the Communist Party who was working in the Czech lands was already rejoicing the coming restoration of the Slovak state, the Slovak fascist state of the Second World War, unless Slovakia reattached itself to Hungary and a structure similar to the former Austria-Hungary be resurrected. A Czech doctor judged that nothing could happen in the Czech lands for the workers were doing too well. However, he thought the communists feared that something might break out in Slovakia as the Slovaks were known to be hot-blooded. And a so-called Kulak disappointed by the outcome in Hungary after the second Soviet intervention that put an end to the revolution, was pinning all the remnants of his hopes on the troubles and the riots which he thought had just occurred in Slovakia. He formulated a positive opinion on the Slovaks' greater ability to act and he deemed them less indifferent than the Czechs. If some Czechs who harbored hostile feelings toward the communist regime counted on the Slovaks to take the initiative of an open resistance movement, others, more supportive of communism, displayed on the contrary ill feelings and nagging suspicion of Slovak separatism. A techni technician in a big industrial complex thus feared that Slovaks would try to take advantage of the Hungarian situation to break away from the Czechs. According to him, the Hungarians had always had a big influence on the Slovaks and knew how to impress them. A restaurant employee declared that the Slovaks were so as vicious as the Hungarians and it wouldn't be hard to lead them to ill-considered provocations. The worker found the situation ugly in Slovakia as the Slovaks, whom he thought to be dreaming of breaking free from the Czechs, would immediately be swallowed by the Hungarians or the Poles. And a coal miner 
who didn't belong to any political party, assessed that the Slovaks were hot-blooded and unreliable since for them, Tiso was the greatest, Tiso being, again, the fascist leader during the Second World War. In his time, everything, everyone was doing fine and everyone held this period in high esteem, he said. According to a priest, the Slovaks yearned for autonomy, whatever the price, even if it meant their incorporation into Hungary. One of his colleagues believed that if something was to happen, then it would be in Slovakia. One could always go there, but he or she would not rest assured to come back alive. One of the other reasons why part of the Czechoslovak audience, after an initial, initial favorable feeling, failed to entirely sympathize with the Hungarian Revolution is because it was shocked by the violence of the insurrection. A Czech conscript, and that is um, now the, um, the husband of the woman we were talking about, wrote to, her, uh, wrote to his wife that the Hungarians were so vicious they could be mistaken for wild beasts or SS men. According to him, certain fascist elements had killed guards in Hungary and carried their heads around on pikes. His conclusion was, either they will get me or I will get them. We are all watching the border with these thoughts in mind. From two workers' point of view, the Hungarian revolutionaries were clearly fascists in view of their brutality. The two were hoping that the borders were going to be hermetically sealed so that no criminal could escape to the West. A former shopkeeper claimed in a pub in front of many people that considering what the members of various gangs had committed in Hungary, a real barbarism, it was high time to concretely speak of hanging and other handlings of the counter-revolutionaries. A former functionary of the Socialist Party wondered privately how the Hungarians could murder in such a brutal way. He prayed God keep us from something similar happening here. A priest remarked that he couldn't approve the fratricidal chaos reigning in Hungary and that the bestialities perpetrated over there didn't ask for comment. The wife of a prisoner who had been jailed for robbing the national property stigmatized nevertheless the counter-revolutionary putsch in Hungary for its savagery and she displayed her support for the Red Army's intervention. A former member of the Socialist Party deemed that every sensible person had to condemn the bestiality of the reactionary forces on innocent victims in Hungary. However, he was thanking in mind the said reaction for having shown its true face, adding that it would henceforth not be possible anymore to find someone who would like to go back to the old days. A coal miner criticized as well the bestiality which presided over Hungary and explained that in contradiction to his past habits, he was now closely following the news since the security of the Czechs was at stake. He expressed his belief that the capitalists were about to strike them, just like the Germans, and beseeched God not to let them, the Germans, come back to Bohemia because they would, because they would kill us all. So the displayed horrors at the 1956 six events stems and reality from people who were generally supporting communism. The disgust at the bloody pictures in the streets of Budapest was mainly concealing the horrified discovery that socialism itself was under attack. The best proof of this might be found in the narrative of the people who did not support communism because they had no problem with the notion of violence. Now, this is what we're going to see. Indeed, the reports show multiple expressions of bitterness or even aggressivity towards the managers, agents, leaders, or representatives at any level of the regime. This latent hostility focused on the fate kept in store for the communists and functionaries in the event of a sudden regime overthrow. Imagination did not lack when it came to describing the corporal punishment to be inflicted to the dignitaries. A propaganda brochure seized during inspection of the mail in Slovakia called for the death of Judeo-Bolshevism and the hanging of the Red Dogs. A worker belonging to the Hungarian minority in Slovakia, whose Hungarian blood blood was supposedly boiling, was preparing himself to hang the dirty communists to the tree. In a Czech pub, a group of reactionary-oriented persons were complaining about the lack of trees on which they could hang the communists. A worker had urged his colleagues to finish as fast as possible the construction of a hoist to use it as a hanging device for the communists. Another one was prepared to use lampposts for the same purpose. The promises of revenge were sometimes very precise. A former private barber 
had with his friends a whole list of communists to hang and believed it was high time to get started. As for the inhabitants of the village of Vesenice, they were discussing among themselves the order in which local functionaries would be hanged in case of a regime overthrow, like in Hungary. The very first ones were to be the mayor, the leader of the local Communist Party organization, and the head of the production at the local cooperative. Anyway, many people insisted they would be the first one to assassinate the communists. Drowning was as well quite popular. An apprentice joiner relished the thought of tying together President Zapotocki and First Secretary Rakoshi before throwing them in the water. But a forest ranger, former merchant, preferred to skewer a few people with a bayonet. A drunk, off a drunk citizen offered during a public meeting of the Communist Party, which is quite, quite amusing, to dig a four meter deep hole in the cemetery in which to throw communists unless he specified they would rather be hanged. To cut a few throats also appeared like a promising perspective for men. A member of parliament, I don't know if this can be believed, supposedly declared to a friend that he hated the communists and would gladly cut all their throats. A Czech medical doctor who was ready uh, to reopen his private practice was as well looking forward to cutting the throat of the communists. A worker was arrested after taking out a knife from his pocket and having shouted while reeling it in the air that it's about to break out and that he would know how to slit all throats. One of his compatriots, member of the communist party, was as well arrested after he sat under the influence while waving a kitchen knife that it was necessary to cut the throats of all STB agents like was the practice in Hungary. During the beetroot harvest, a so-called Kulak woman declared to the assembled company that her cousin, the butcher, had already prepared the hooks on which to hang the communists and slit their throats. And a Czech coal miner was keeping a knife in his pocket around the clock while repeating all the while he would cut somebody's head. In this context, it is not surprising that the representative of the communist regime felt rather nervous. Some, like a medical doctor, decided to keep a low profile. Others, like a priest, feared they would be excommunicated for having collaborated with the communists. Others still, like a civil servant, worked on installing bars at his windows because he feared for his life, while a former member of the Communist Party was terrified by what he believed to be a pending regime change as he thought even former members like him would be assassinated. So the example of the people who did not favor communism shows that violence is not something that they opposed by principle. Indeed, if one looks back on the first years of the communist regime and remember, remembers that the monetary devaluation of 1953 caused riots in Poznan and elsewhere, the violent element seems somehow overpowered by the socio-economical argument. In other words, it's not that people were not capable of violence, it is that they had no sufficient reason to become collectively violent. In 1956 Czechoslovakia, the system was running rather smoothly, social benefits were tangible, and if the economic system was surely not perfect, it was nevertheless working and was mainly on the rise since the downfall of 1953. According to American economists, the pre-war standard of living was recovered around 1955 in Czechoslovakia, as opposed to the end of the 1950s in Poland and supposedly 1963 in Hungary. Besides, the pre-war level was significantly higher in Czechoslovakia. The Czechoslovak citizens themselves were very much aware of their privileged economic, economic situation as an explanation of the calm prevailing in their country. If their standard of living was much higher than in Poland or Hungary, was it worth it to fight? A so-called Kulak was of the opinion that the regime was bad, but no, it was not worth it to try and fight like in Hungary. A priest preferred a bit of repression to glory and dead bodies in the streets and the fields. A small landowner commented that freedom of speech, freedom of speech wouldn't help him in any way if it meant he would have nothing to eat anymore. One of his colleagues proclaimed that the Czechs had a higher standard of living than the Poles and the Hungarians and that they had as well more culture, which is why the situation was different in their country. To a wide majority, these material assets appeared substantial enough to deter them from any inconsiderate action and they rather put up patiently with the regime while awaiting better days. Now, can we believe these reports? They are, after all, the product of a double bias. First, 
the agent's interest was to repress any form of dissent, as well as to give the impression to their superiors that they were working well. And second, the population was wary of the police and so took care of not talking too much. But this bias is rather easily taken care of. Here are five things we must keep in mind in order to interpret these reports correctly. One, the STB agents who recruited informants usually exhibited a certain authoritarian personality type. Also, most of them were still staunch believers in the communist ideology. So you have to adjust the reports accordingly. Two, the agents wrote for the benefits of their superiors. As such, they tended to exaggerate the good feelings of the population. A typical result are statements referring to the massive approval of the population uh, by the population of the Central Committee's policy. The vagueness of such statements suffices to discard them as reliable information. And so I never count them. Three, another constant feature is the doctoring of the agents and or the informant's lack of work in the hope to give on the contrary an active impression. Numerous reports, especially in Slovakia, are more than vague. They concern ill-defined groups of people, for instance, the workers of such and such factories, the employees of such firms, or even the vast majority of the citizens in our district who allegedly support the government on this or that policy. The author spends a minimal time writing this report and probably expects to procure maximum satisfaction to his superiors, but such reports are unverifiable and they tell us actually more about the author uh, than about the population's mood. For, on the other hand, the search for real or imaginary opponents, the enemy in contemporary vocabulary, might have led them to exaggerate the danger represented by individual actions. An innocent joke told at the pub after too many beers could become an attempt at sabotage. However, this would be subversive activity is usually um, much less of a genuine opposition to the regime than these agents might have pretended it was. And finally, one central element of, of discourse, of the narrative, is a strategy of silence, absolute silence concerning Khrushchev's secret speech, silence on the victims of political repression and on the show trial. This, you will never find a word of it in the reports. And the responsibility of rulers was never openly questioned. On the other hand, or if it was, then these people would end in jail. On the other hand, less compromising topics like more general criticism, for instance, shortages, that could be evoked and that was uh, evoked. We can profit from these massive reports also by corroborating them with other sources, reports from competing institutions, especially the Communist Party, but also the regular police who had very different reports compared to the secret police, interviews made by Radio Free, Radio Free Europe at the time, the reports uh, from the French and from the American embassies in Prague at the time, the official media, the media published abroad by Czechoslovak exiles, the Western media, as well as, as Jerome uh, hinted to it, the interviews that they carried out with 1956 witnesses in the mid-1990s. The extracts of reports I just presented are the common characteristics that appear in all these sources. I showed to you, I spoke to you, only about the reports, the, the tone of reports that shows in every single source. They are rel relatively homogeneous throughout the Czechoslovak territory, and the authorities apparently fully believe them, or at least I've never found any suggestion that they were contested in any way. Popular opinion was the only form of public opinion that the communist dictatorships could afford. There was no free public sphere, and certain opinions could land a citizen in jail, but the population, of course, did have an opinion on the rulers and the rule and on the rule. So the, uh, the the difficulty is to figure out what this opinion was. Historian Paul Corner has underlined how vital it was for regimes that had suppressed any channel of spontaneous communications communication between the rulers and the rule to still know what was going on. So to monitor public opinion allowed them not only to suppress dissent but also to search for legitimacy in the eyes of the people. So these reports were crucially important to the regime. As it turned out, even in the most stringent dictatorship, the individuals held on their ability to express themselves. In this sense, they never became merely a passive subject of authority, but they retained some real space for action and reaction. Political regimes 
generally satisfy some social interest and rarely survive by force alone, as historian Sheila Fitzpatrick put it. So in conclusion, the arguments presented here could be summarized by stating the obvious. Most Czechs and Slovaks would have favored democracy over communism. They were looking forward to the impending demise of the communist regime, but they did, did acknowledge its credentials in terms of welfare and well-being and chose to profit from them in the meantime. These reports indicate as well that the 1956 events rather strengthened the hold of the Communist Party on society. Already prior to and after its conquest of the monopoly of power, its influence had been prominent, indeed massive. In 1946, Clement Gottwald, the Czechoslovak Stalin, had scored a big victory and the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia was by far the biggest and most popular actor on the political front. A few months after the takeover, at the end of the year 1948, it was congregating in its ranks no less than one Czechoslovak adult out of three, that is to say, and it's not known enough, close to 50% of the Czech active population. One half of the people who were working in the Czech Republic were members of the Communist Party. In relation to its population, the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia had twice as many members as in Hungary, and almost four times more than in Poland. If it certainly doesn't mean that there were as many convinced communists, it does mean that there were as many people who were willing to play, at least to a certain extent, the game of pretense. In other words, the strategy of the Czechoslovak population can be described as one of adaptation to the communist regime rather than one of open confrontation. Vice versa, these reports unquestionably show that the official propaganda was successfully instrumentalizing certain cultural and even nationalistic traits. This is especially true for the Czechs, with a traditional emphasis on egalitarianism and a tendency to national self-defining in terms of culture. Furthermore, if there is such a thing as a Czech reticence to use violence, the Czech, the communist propaganda did manage to embody it as well. It is a fact that communism had settled in a velvety way, and it is just as true that when it did fall without violence in 1989, it was in the name of a collective identity centered around values such as truth, love, and humanity. Finally, the complete divergence of interests between the Czechoslovak, Polish, and Hungarian societies in 1956 could not be better illustrated than by this fact. During the few revolutionary weeks in Hungary and Poland, the support for the communist regime in Czechoslovakia was mingled with an expression of patriotism. The Hungarians and the Poles were fighting to redeem the national consciousness at the expense of a communist regime perceived as a symbol of the Soviet domination. At the same time, despite its dictatorial attributes and its definite unpopularity, the Czechoslovak communist regime was awarded a new legitimacy. And that's it. Thank you. Mute, mute. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Muriel, for for this uh, wonderful paper, and um, thank you for for presenting this uh, this society or these societies with all the different elements. You you have mentioned so many so many actors, uh, workers, uh, employees, peasant, functionary, barbers, kulak, also a priest, a doctor. Um, it's um, yeah, it gives us an idea of the complexity of this. Uh, it reminds us complexity of the society and thank you for sharing your interest for this uh, for these files for these reports it's true they are really fascinating when we read them um because they are often as you as you have said often puzzling disconcerting uh what to do with what we are with what we as historians read how to interpret that and they, they give the impression to to get closer to people, uh, to get closer to, to discussion or even to rumors. Always difficult to, to know what is a rumor and how it is born. But with these reports, we, we get this, this feeling to, to be closer to people. And sometimes, as you said, it can be a false feeling. Um, but, um, yeah. Uh, I would have question, but, uh, again, in the comments, uh, if uh, somebody in the audience has, um, as a question, um, you can write them. I, I can start. There, there is many, many uh, issues that you mentioned 
that are related or that we find back uh, in the exhibition. Of course, when you talk about um, uh, the soldier who is watching the frontier, uh, in the exhibition, we have this movie about uh, about the frontier, about the protection of the frontier. Of course, what is very interesting is the movie is about uh, the Western frontier, uh, and it's important to watch the frontier against or the delimitation with the West. But uh, here, in your in your case, it is very interesting to see that if, even the frontier in the eastern part of the eastern, east frontier, it was also uh, a challenge. Uh, it was an issue to, to protect it and to watch it. With all these images of the 50s of uh, frontier, board, uh, boarding guard and uh, things like that. So. There are also uh, different cases. Uh, again, don't hesitate to, to write. Um, what you said at the beginning about um, what people expected then and that they expected a, a change uh, that the even communists um, many many people they don't really want but they expect uh, a political change a geopolitical change and of course today we know that the communist regime will last until the end of the 80s but um, but then it was it was not certain and uh, I think it is something we developed in the book because we think it is important in the artistic creation, this question of unpredictability of this time. In the 50s, it was very, very difficult for people to um, just to project in a few years uh, to know what how it will look like in, in a few years. And the death of Stalin, the destalinization, it always changed the world and uh, even the geopolitical frame should change according to, to this. I Maybe I can, if there is no question, I can ask a, a precise question about the, the memory of the Second World War. Uh, you mentioned it several times. You mentioned uh, the, um, the question of the fascist Slovak state and the, the references to the fascist Slovak state. You you mentioned also, I find it really interesting, the fear of the return of the Germans. Uh, very, yeah, quite uh, quite in interesting. And it seems to me, but you tell me if you if you agree that the memory of the Second World War is really important and practically more important than the apprehension of the geopolitical situation of, uh, of 56, I, I have the feeling, but again, maybe I'm wrong, that people are thinking with the references of the Second World War. They are still in this continuity of the Second World War and not really in, um, they are not thinking with, um, with what is for us obvious for the 50s with the references of the Cold War. Do you agree or is it too... Yeah, no, I agree, uh, except that it's not exactly the Second World War that was uh, crucially at stake here, but the memory of the expulsion of the Sudeten Germans. Mm -hmm. You know, there used to be a German minority in Czechoslovakia that constituted, uh, constituted about a third of the population in the Czech lands, um, and about three million uh, of these Germans were expelled uh, in 1945 uh, in exceedingly brutal circumstances. Um, and actually, it's estimated that 30 to 40,000 of them uh, died in the process. And at times, it was actually so brutal that it can be practically uh, named um, ethnic cleansing. Um, and so um, it's not so much the memory of the war. Of course, um, the Czechs were, especially the Czechs, but also the Slovaks, were uh, genuinely grateful for the Red Army um, to the Red Army for liberating them from the Germans, from the Nazis, that is clear. But mainly it's the memory of these excesses that placed Czechoslovakia in the geopolitical uh, sphere of the Soviets forever. I mean, for, 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 for the future as could be uh, seen at this time, because they very much feared that these Sudeten Germans that are freshly expelled, that have lost everything, that have been living on this territory forever, uh, will demand revenge. And indeed, um, from other studies I, I did at the Austrian border, for instance, the, uh, the, the German-speaking minority that was expelled towards Austria it was just resettling on the other side of the border, literally a few hundred meters uh, apart, were ready to go back to war. 
to reconquer Czechoslovakia. Um, and the Czechs knew that. Um, and, and there was a lot of hatred, obviously. I mean, after after both the occupy, I mean, I don't want to say only uh, the Czechs were guilty here. Of course, uh, the Nazis had occupied uh, Bohemia and Moravia. Uh, there had been, you know, 120,000 people who died in the process, plus uh, 75,000 Jews, plus 120,000 Jews in Slovakia, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the, the score uh, was pretty long to settle, right? But the Czechs were terrified that the Germans would want to come back. And they felt guilty. And I think they felt guilty about this. Um, and therefore, we absolutely, there was no question that they will remain in the Soviet sphere because only the Soviets can protect them. Because, you know, the French and the Brits had betrayed them uh, during the Munich agreements in 1948. So they knew they cannot count on the West. And certainly, the fact that the West was promising to help, you know, Radio for Europe was promising to help Hungary, was promising to help the revolutionaries, and then the Americans did nothing. So, if anything, 1956 confirmed for the Czechoslovaks that they could count only on the Soviets. So there was absolutely no question that they will not try, even try to get out of this uh, Soviet sphere. So that was a very crucial factor in 1956. And otherwise I wanted to react to something else you said about um, how people were, um, uh, were not very, how could I say, in a fighting mood. There was one anecdote I didn't tell uh, that is uh, what I, I nicknamed the orange gas scenario. It was like this, and that drove the Americans crazy, actually. The Americans were really furious about this, the diplomats at the American embassy. But uh, there was a rumor circulating that the Americans have a special gas, and this gas smells like oranges, and they will come to Czechoslovakia, and they will send this gas over overnight, and it will smell like oranges everywhere. And when people wake up, the Americans will be here and the communists will be gone. <laughs> the American embassy was really desperate and scratching their head like, all these people are crazy, like what did you expect? You know, they, they want us to liberate them, they don't want to do anything, this is impossible, and so on and so on. Um, so, but that gives a pretty good um, idea about how revolutionary the mood was, meaning it was not revolutionary at all. Yes, uh, thank you for this, um, for this anecdote. Um, I, I would like to, to come back to another point of your of your paper, a question that um, uh, seems to us quite important. That's a question of violence. Uh, so the violence of what uh, was happening in, in Hungary uh, in '56. We could also speak of the violence of the revolt in East Germany in uh, in '53. Uh, there are always very very violent um, um, episodes, and um, I. Well, I'm also speaking about this point because in the exhibition we have these images, uh, uh, one of the very, very rare images made uh, in Eastern Central Europe about the Hungarian uprising. It's a painting by Tübke, by the East German painter Tübke, and uh, uh, it was a commission to represent the Hungarian revolution as a fascist coup d'etat, as it was a... Uh, uh, the official uh, presentation of the of the Hungarian Revolution, and uh, it's uh, a painting about um, a, a scene of the population killing uh, representative com of the authorities, so lynching, really. And um, actually, it's quite interesting to find this uh, this uh, iconography of uh, of lynch of uh, killing someone in public. But my, my question is, um, you, you said everything about uh, this uh, brutal way, this savagery, this bestiality. It seems to me that one of the, um, of, uh, of the difficult point uh, in 56 is that the violence um, didn't make sense for many people, observer from, from abroad. They couldn't understand it or they couldn't understand the, the sense uh, or the, the degree of violence. Or again, I come back to the Second World War, uh, the violence is, um, and physical violence is associated with fascism. Um, the people who did the violence were accused, presented as, a, as fascist. And, well, I, I I don't have um, a precise question, but um, do, would you say that uh, it, it was difficult for 
people who live in 56 in the different countries around Hungary to make sense uh, of the of the violence of what was happening in uh, in Hungary. Uh, or, yeah, I yeah. don't have I don't have a double answer to that. First is um, your violent. Um, uh, how could I say? The, the, it's said, for instance, that some of the participants to the Poznan um, uh, demonstration in June 1956 that ended in many dead, I think more than 70 dead, uh, so it was a very violent, uh, violently repressed, uh, were actually suffering from hunger. Um, and in any case, had very little to lose, because if you're hungry or if you're having really a really hard time to find even something to feed your family, you're much more prone to going out and fight tanks with your bare hands. You know, because if you have nothing, what else can you do? I mean, it's a question of survival. Uh, whereas if you're living relatively comfortably, uh, you have a, the com communist regime has provided you with a comfortable flat or a comfortable home, or you have stolen this home from the expelled Sudeten Germans and you find yourself, you know, now the owner of a pretty big house with a garden, you know, you have a lot more to lose um, if you, even if you don't like the regime by going out and demonstrating against it. So that's that's one element. Um, and the other is that um, in 1956, we are already after the period of Stalinism. And I think by then, it's pretty clear to the people that the violence can be also communist. You know, there has been the forced collectivization. There has been, you know, 50,000 people who were sent to labor camps. Uh, there have been the show trials. Um, there have been, you know, tens of thousands of people who had been fired from their position. There has been, you know, basically Stalinist terror. So by then, people are well aware that violence is on both sides. Um, so certainly, um, again, I mean, it's, it raises the question of what are you ready to face and what are you ready to lose? Yeah. And if you know this regime is ready to kill you, and if you know you have a comfortable way of life and a family to protect, then is it the right moment to get violent? Isn't it better to wait until the Americans will come with their orange gas and you won't have to do anything? Yeah, that was the reasoning. Yes, yes. Um, and maybe it, uh, a last uh, question before we, uh, we end this lecture. Uh, precisely about this um, uh, living of stan standard, li uh, living standard and material condition. Um, it, it was very interesting what you say, this comparison between countries and uh, the inhabitants, the citizens compare themselves uh, permanently and they will do that. Um, they, they did that before and they will do that uh, after. It, it's really uh, this space of Eastern Central Europe as a space of comparison, of comparability. I and very often we take for granted that areas like the Czech areas or the German, East German area, they are, um, they have better, the, the living conditions are better there than, uh, than in the other, in the other regions of uh, Eastern Central Europe. Maybe it's a very provocative question, but I am always asking, is it not also a kind of national pride to, to consider that home, it is always better and we are more well equipped and the uh, industry is very, very strong and things like that. And agriculture is very, very productive. Um, can't we also um, consider that as a national gaze and a national stereotype more than a tangible reality? Yeah, certainly where uh, the communist regimes were more successful is where I would even go further than you and say it's where they managed to embody uh, patriotism in their own country. And mm -hmm. the, the Czechs were very good at that. The communist regime essentially defended national interests as seen from the Czech point of view. And that's why the regime was kind of awarded a certain legitimacy from the start that was difficult to beat. Again, the Soviet Union was the sole protector of Czechoslovakia against its enemies. And in a way, you might even say that this was largely true to some extent in the East German part, because um, when they had to kind of recreate a new identity, uh, the, how could I say, the East German state was kind of um, intimately linked to this communist identity. So if, if you were an East German as opposed to West German, you were a communist. So somehow they managed to recreate a form of patriotism there too. But in Poland and Hungary, on the other hand, this, and, and, and it was true also in Russia, certainly 
uh, Russian communism was linked to Russian nationalism or patriotism. But in Poland and Hungary, unsurprisingly, and that's why you know there were such um, such uh, events there, the uh, communist regime was linked, on the contrary, to being the enemy of the nation. Yeah, the the regime was imposed from the outside by the enemy, by the Russian enemy. So. There is no local patriotism that can be linked to the communist regime. And that's why these communist regimes were much less assured than, for instance, the Czechoslovak one or the Russian one, for that matter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. And thank um, you much. yeah, thank you for for the paper and for the for the discussions. All these issues are um are absolutely relevant uh for they bring a lot uh, for for the for the exhibition and that's uh what we like to do with this lecture to to have insights historical insights to uh, to yeah to highlight some aspect of the of the exhibition so thanks thank you Marianne. and uh we we will stop here uh, as i said at the beginning uh we will have a lecture um each uh, each week and uh, next week we will hear Alexandra Kusa. Uh, she works at the Slovak National Gallery, and she will speak uh, in, in Bratislava. She will speak about the history of this uh, of this gallery, of this museum, and the history of the collections, uh, born precisely in the in the fifties. So we will come back to the Czechoslovak context and more the Slovak context um, from the point of view of the of the collection and the museum's collection. So see you next week.